So buffers. Buffers are solutions that resist pH changes. A buffer is a solution that contains both a weak acid and its conjugate base. And so when you add acid to that, well, let's do these in order. If you add base to a buffer solution, the weak acid neutralizes the base. And if you add acid to it, that conjugate base neutralizes the acid. Your blood is a buffered solution, and it resists pH changes. And it's pretty interesting how it does that. It has to do with um, carbonate. And so carbonic acid is the weak acid. Um, and there's a little blurb in your textbook that, that talks a little bit about that. And you, you know, if you're interested, you might want to read that. So your blood pH is pretty tightly regulated between 7.36 and 7.40. And that's where you're good. If you get below 7.0 or above 7.8, you're dead. Really bad. So just that small change in hydroxide ion concentration, hydrogen ion concentration, will kill you. What would cause your blood pH to change? What would cause your blood pH to change? Um, well, I was just reading through the, one, um, the little blurb in the textbook about ethylene glycol antifreeze. So if you drink ethylene glycol, and it's a problem with children and animals because it kind of tastes sweet. And so it's not like something that's nasty to taste. It tastes kind of good. So if you, you know, like say you're, well, we'll pick on cats because more people hate cats. I love cats. but So say your cat drank some ethylene glycol. What's going to happen? Well, it's an alcohol and your body metabolizes it. But then it produces an acid. And your body, that gets into your blood and drops the pH of your blood. And so your body tries to compensate. It makes you hyperventilate because then you get more carbon dioxide into your blood, which helps to neutralize that acid. But it, if, you drank, if the cat drank enough, that's not going to work. And so then the pH of the blood drops too low. And that messes up all these complicated interrelated reactions that are going on in your body and death results. So interestingly, the way to treat an ethylene glycol poisoning is to give ethyl alcohol. Kind of base? No, that's alcohol. It's like pour vodka down the cat's throat. Because your body metabolizes the ethyl alcohol preferentially to the ethylene glycol. And so you keep your body busy with the ethyl alcohol, and then the ethylene glycol well, just kind of slips out. No, don't. <laughs> Not something to mess around with. Not something to mess around with. But, you know, the, the problem is, you know, your radiator leaks and it spills all over the ground. And if there's, you know, puddles, a dog could come and drink it. You know, it, it happens, sadly. Has it ever happened to that work for drinking? Someone accidentally drank alcohol and then... Oh. I believe so, or they wouldn't put it in the book. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, so... so really, we don't try to... Right, because there's no way that you could neutralize it. And so this is, you know, the, the scientific thinking. It's like, okay, what's different about the ethylene glycol and what could we do to make the body stop doing that so it wouldn't harm itself? There are some things that, yes, you could swallow something and neutralize it in your stomach and you'd be fine. But you, you can't just neutralize ethylene glycol. I mean, there are, there are reactions that you could do, but those are probably going to hurt you more in your stomach than, than the ethylene glycol would. So it's interesting. And there are other things where the best solution is to vomit. <laughs> Get it out. So let's look more specifically at these buffers. Um, acetic acid and sodium acetate is a buffer system. So acetic acid... HC2H3O2 is a weak acid. It's not one of those seven or six or however many your book had. I think it was six strong acids. If it's not on the strong acid list, then it's a weak acid. And in order for it to be a buffer system, it has to be a weak acid. Because if this was a strong acid, it would dissociate completely and there would be no more acid left here. 
okay? And we need to have this molecule intact. So if we add base, like sodium hydroxide, to this system, the acetic acid will react with it and neutralize it. You'll get water and sodium acetate. If you add acid to this combination, you also have sodium acetate here. That's the conjugate base of the weak acid, and that reacts with the acid and, and neutralizes it. So let's just look real quick here. So um, HC2H3O2 in water. It's a weak acid. It's in equilibrium. The weak acid, it's an acid. It donates a proton. So it'll donate a proton to the water and become acetate. So this is the conjugate base, we'll call it CB, and this is the weak acid. So you have to have a weak acid and its conjugate base in order for it to be a buffer. Yeah, and then the water is acting as the base and the hydronium ion is the conjugate acid. Yeah. But the one we're interested in is the acetic acid and the sodium acetate. And then we get a picture. Pictures are great. You also have to have significant amounts of both. So you can't just take acetic acid and put it in water and say, oh, yeah, well, it dissociated a little bit, and there's a little bit of sodium acetate. That's not going to act as a buffer. You have to also add sodium acetate. And so generally, roughly equal amounts. So here's an illustration of a buffer. And we have um, the purple are the acetic acid molecules, and the blue are the sodium and the acetate, which ionize. And so we have here the conjugate base, and here's the weak acid. So if we add hydrogen ion to this solution, that added hydrogen ion will react with the conjugate base and form more of the weak acid. And then over here, if we're adding hydroxide ion, the hydroxide ion will react with the weak acid and form water and the conjugate base. And so the solution will resist changes to pH. You can add base to it, and the pH really won't change. You could add acid to it, and the, it really won't change. Now, the buffering capacity is limited, and it depends on the concentration of the acid in the base. So you can't add infinitely to it. It'll eventually overwhelm the buffer, and then the pH will change. Okay, so this is the sort of question that I want you to be able to answer for the final um, about buffers. So which of the following is a buffer solution? So let's look at A. We've got sulfuric acid and sulfurous acid. Is that a buffer solution? You don't think so. Okay, so that sounds like a guess. No, it isn't. But why? What is a buffer? What two things? Weak acid and a conjugate base. Okay, sulfurous acid is a weak acid. Sulfuric acid is a strong acid. Do we have the conjugate base? No, there's no conjugate base. Okay, so that's, that's not. Um, how about HF and NAF? No. Is HF a weak acid? Yes. Yes, it is. Is this the conjugate base? What is the conjugate base of HF? This is the conjugate base right here. So does sodium fluoride contain the conjugate base? Yeah, it does. This is a soluble salt, sodium ion, and fluoride ion. There you have the conjugate base right there. But then it kind of comes as weak. It doesn't dissociate very easily. 
Well, it is a weak acid, and that's why you have to add the salt of the conjugate base as well. So if you just put HF in solution, you just have a weak acid solution. You also have to put sodium fluoride in to make sure that you have plenty of that conjugate base. So the first thing to do is to look at the acid and ask yourself, is that a strong acid or a weak acid? That's a weak acid. Okay, then look at the other substance. The difference between these two is that one has H and one has a metal. So this has sodium and this has hydrogen. This is the acid, and here we've just swapped the hydrogen for a sodium. It could be potassium fluoride or calcium fluoride. It could be anything. The fluoride is what we're interested in. So this is a buffer solution. How about HCl and NaCl? Yes. HCl is a strong acid. But that does have the conjugate base. It does have the conjugate base. So this, this looks good. We've got an acid in the conjugate base because chloride is the conjugate base. But it's not a strong, it's not a weak acid. And so when you put hydrochloric acid, all you get is chloride and the hydrogen ions. And you don't have any intact molecules of the acid, and so it won't, it won't work as a, as a buffer. So that's not. How about sodium chloride and sodium hydroxide? Is there a weak acid in there? Is there any kind of an acid in there? Is sodium chloride an acid? No. Is sodium hydroxide an acid? No. No. Sodium hydroxide is a strong base. But we have to have, what am I writing here? I'm just scribbling. We have to have a weak acid and its conjugate base. So we've got sodium ions, we've got hydroxide ions, we've got sodium ions and chloride ions. We don't have a weak acid. Now, chloride, um, actually that's not even the conjugate base of a weak acid. There's just nothing. There's no conjugate base of a weak acid and there's no weak acid. So I'm pretty much telling you that there's going to be a question like this on the final. And how do you solve it? You have to look at it and find there has to be a weak acid and its conjugate base. So in this first one, H2SO3 is a weak acid, but there's no conjugate base. What might be the conjugate base of this? How did we, how did we do that? What's different between the acid and the conjugate base? It's lost a proton, a hydrogen ion. So if we take H2SO3 and we remove one proton, it'll be HSO3 minus. So that could be maybe sodium hydrogen sulfite or potassium hydrogen sulfite. So if it was in this, as you know, it would be like this, NaHSO3. Okay? And here's the chapter in review. And that's the end. The end of the class. Sorry, my brain is just